Uh, so for this next session, uh, we have three speakers. Uh, Dr. Jen Rainier is actually running this session. Uh, she's going to be remote, so she's going to zoom in in a second. Um, I'm going to introduce everyone um, one at a time, just since she's remote. Um, we're going to have two law enforcement leaders speak, and followed by Dr. Rainier, and then we'll leave some time for questions uh, in the end. Um, so. First, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Colonel Glenn McNeil for the North Carolina Highway Patrol. Uh, Governor Cooper appointed Colonel McNeil as commander of the Highway Patrol on February 2nd, 2017. Uh, he's a North Carolina native. He's a military veteran. And his first um, patrol in Durham was in Durham in 1993. He rose through the ranks, various positions. He served in special operations. Um, he led special operations, and then he was promoted to the rank of major, and then he uh, uh, served as the director of training, and he oversaw the administration and the trooper academy before he was appointed to his uh, current position. He's also a graduate of the FBI National Academy, and he lives in Cary with his wife and three kids. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Colonel McNeil. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I don't take any joy in being selected to speak on this topic. And the reason for that is because we have experienced the deaths and the loss of five state troopers in three years. So that's why I was asked to come and talk to you just a little bit about resiliency. So although I'm pleased and I give you all greetings on behalf of the North Carolina State Highway Patrol, this is not a subject that I'll celebrate speaking about. Resiliency. What does resiliency mean, ma'am, if I may? What does it mean to you? She said to pick yourself up and to go on. Sir, what does resiliency mean to you? Okay. What does resiliency mean to you, Lieutenant? Staying in the fight? Getting back up? Well, for the time that I have this morning, I'm going to talk about the ability to recover quickly from a difficult or tough situation. The North Carolina State Highway Patrol, we were created with the sole purpose of keeping people safe on our highways. And that mission hasn't changed over this 90 plus years that we have been providing services to the citizens of North Carolina and well beyond. Our founding members were sworn into office on July 1st, 1929. But within less than 24 hours, we lost our first state trooper was killed in the line of duty. This new experiment in being a state agency was shaken to its core by having lost a state trooper within 24 hours of us being a created organization. And over the last 90 years, we've lost 66 North Carolina state troopers in the line of duty. So for us, taking us back to the very first loss, our leadership was then challenged. Is this mission going to be successful? Man, we've lost somebody right out of the gate in less than 24 hours. So resiliency has been a high priority because it hit home for us in less than 24 hours of our existence. So for our agency, the resiliency process it begins for each and every patrol school, day one. As I stand before each of you today, we have our 150th and 151st patrol school in session right now at our academy. And through their entire training process, staff instructors will stress the importance of working together as a team to overcome the obstacles that lie ahead. Now, as I go through this presentation, I'm gonna talk about my beloved organization, the North Carolina State Highway Patrol. 
But as you all see and know, not everyone present is in law enforcement, but they are in public safety and they are in positions and places in businesses. Active shooter occurrences happen everywhere. Domestic violence occurs everywhere. So I'm going to talk about having a plan to address all aspects of trauma and how we as an organization remain resilient throughout. But as our cadets go through our patrol school, they must rely on one another and be resilient in order to become a North Carolina State Trooper. And it must be understood that this sort of mindset began in our exception more than 90 years ago. Our charter members embarked on a journey, a difficult public safety journey, which demanded that they rely on each, of the, each other to accomplish the mission that lied ahead. Our organization is a family-oriented working organization that has been passed down through the years to our uniform and civilian members to make sure that we look out for one another. Today, our organization prides itself on policies and procedures that are in place, which outline our response to difficult and unfortunate situations such as hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, civil unrest, protests, active shooter situations, and something that is on the rise for our agency, suicide by cop or by police officer. But as I stand before you with a heavy heart, I am here because over the last three years, our organization has experienced the deaths of five state troopers. But during this same time frame, several members of our organization have found themselves in situations that could have easily have taken their lives. Over this same period of time, four state troopers were shot. Several state troopers were hit by drunk drivers and they remain out of duty today, but they are alive. So we've had multiple incidents where the addition to the line of duty, line of duty deaths for our agency could have occur, occurred. But with this in mind, our organization has gone, undergone many encounters requiring the need for our members to have outside assistance. But I'll pose this question for everybody present in the room. Are you, your organization, and members who work for your various entity, are you prepared to handle the loss of a member? And if you don't have a plan, I hope today, after my presentation and the good sheriff's presentation, you all will get ready and develop a plan for your various organizations. The worst and most traumatic situation that any organization can face is losing a member of your organization or your team. Regardless of the way the member dies, their loss leaves a void that must be endured by those whom are left behind. Being able to cope with a member's loss while performing duties that arise as a result of their loss requires a plan. This plan must be in place long before the unfortunate event takes place and must be rehearsed to ensure adherence. Appropriate personnel must be assigned to carry out very specific tasks and duties must be divided up amongst your rank and file, sworn or civilian. Everyone has a role to play. And I'll just use this as an example. We are all gathered here today. And if one of our civilian folks that are present become ill, let's say for an example, and I hope and pray it doesn't happen, that they have a heart attack and we do CPR and we get them safely to Duke to get them appropriately cared for. But do we know that person's next of kin? Do we have a database already set up to be able to know who their spouse is, where their kids 
attend school? And are we prepared to immediately send folks to their place of business and to schools to pick them up to notify them that their loved one has fallen ill while at this conference? Again, if you don't have a plan, you won't be prepared should an emergency befall your organization. Everyone has a role to play. And I'm gonna briefly talk about line of duty deaths. From the moment a tragic situation such as a line of duty death occurs, members must be identified to take immediate action. For an example, in the case of Trooper Kevin Connor, who was murdered on October the 17th, two years ago, while conducting a traffic stop in Columbus County, several critical procedures had to be followed. These procedures, they included several of the following, securing the crime scene, ensuring sufficient personnel were assigned to search for the suspects who were at large, getting our fallen hero safely to the hospital to continue to try to save his life, information dissemination to our neighboring law enforcement partners and first responders, debriefing the media whom were arriving on the scene. Those are just to name a few of what was occurring within a moment's notice for our organization. While each of these duties were fully carried out to the highest levels of professional excellence, it must be understood that all of our members involved in these important roles were hurting, me included. All of our leadership within our organization, we are included in that number. Beyond the active crime scene lies a broken family, which must be notified that their loved one had been killed in the line of duty. An entire district of grieving members who had lost a member of their family, an organization whom will be forever changed based upon an instantaneous action. But how are we as a North Carolina State Highway Patrol able to cope? First of all, I'll begin, we have a rank structure. That rank structure allows us to be able to have a next man up always ready or next woman up to be able to stand in the gap to ensure that we meet and exceed our mission. But we have what I think is probably the best program that our organization offers in our members assistance program. Earlier, I spoke about having a plan in place to ensure that all of our employees achieve success in all that they do. But when a tragic situation befalls any organization, it is extremely important that we are able to immediately and as soon as we possibly can identify the assistance needed for our members who have been involved in a traumatic experience. Whether it's another supervisor, peer support, a chaplaincy program in which we have an outstanding chaplaincy program with more than 60 chaplains, chaplains who volunteer with in our organization or using a local pastor, you must relay to grieving members that they are not alone. We have a, crit a critical incident stress management team that's in place and it's known as our members assistant program. We call it our MAT team. They're there to support our members on one-on-one, -on -one, in group settings, and we also offer it to other first responders here in North Carolina and also anywhere in the country. The presenters that talked earlier about their situation that happened here in Durham, our members assistance team was offered to the police department and to the fire department. And I'm pleased to hear that the sheriff's, I mean, that the fire department, that they have their own program. Our program is made up of sworn and civilian folks. Our medical director and our medical folks are also a part of this program. 
but we also have medical volunteers, psychologists, medical profession, professionals throughout North Carolina, counselors, who also volunteer their time and their talents to be a part of this program. And it is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365. I'd like to also share with you about the importance of this program because I was on the receiving end of the blessings of this program. Two years ago, my best friend, Eric Atkinson, he committed suicide. And when he did so, his wife and his two teenage boys happened to be in the home when he did it. And they found him. And so on my way riding to the hospital to be with his wife and his children, I called our MAT team liaison. I said, listen, this family has gone through a horrific set of circumstances. Can we provide them assistance? He said, no problem. We have a psychologist and a doctor that works in that county. And so within 24 hours, the next day, we had a medical doctor, we had a psychologist, and we also had a state trooper whom his father had committed suicide, was present in the home with my best friend's family to offer them support. And they have been there over this last two years. And I share that very personal example that this program is phenomenal and it's available to all of our first responders here in North Carolina. But throughout the entire process of a death or serious injury situation, we afford our members the opportunity to seek professional assistance whenever needed. And there is never any stigma attached to a state trooper or one of our civilian employees needing assistance and help. From beginning to end, we offer debriefing avenues, affording those affected to come together as a group. It must be understood, and most humbly, I share this with everybody, it must be understood that the grieving process, it does not end after our beloved fallen member has been laid to rest. It continues for a lifetime. But our organization, we have a very serious charge. When we lose a member, our charge to all of our rank and file is that we never forget that member whom we lost in the line of duty. Every court date, every anniversary, every memorial service, we must and we will have patrol representation there. One of our fallen heroes whom we lost recently, his son just had a birthday. He turned seven years old and he received a card. He received money and a gift, but most importantly, he will always and his sister will always receive love and support from the North Carolina State Highway Patrol. That is our charge to be of a family and to stand in the gap of one of our fallen heroes. The families left behind must know that they are forever a part of your organization's family and that they will never be forgotten. They must know that the sacrifice of their loved one will never be in vain and that we will always hold their service in the highest respect and honor. As commander of the State Highway Patrol, I place great emphasis on setting our state troopers up for success by creating a culture that values coaching, mentoring, and development of all of our employees. And there is a theme here, wellness, making sure that our folks are supported and, be, and, 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 and feel whole. That remains our highest priority. And this thought process is communicated throughout all of our ranks. We as an organization, we know and we understand that we are in the people business, not just the accidents and the calls for service that we respond to, but also how we support one another within our organization. The support that we give to one another, it remains our highest responsibility. Again, resiliency and how we respond to the things that we are affected by. The patrol would not be as successful as it is today 
without those who work tirelessly to provide the very best in public safety to the citizens of our state. But what's most important than that is how we support each other. You must make every effort to never forget the value of your people. And as a leader, you must always be in a place to recognize those who are in need. As I prepare to take my seat, I wanna share with you from a very humble and private place, talking about the power of being present. How do you, when you meet a spouse for the very first time and she's lying on the floor in the fetal position crying into a pillow, the power of being present. You go and meet them where they are. You get down on your knees and you try to comfort them. No words are needed. It's simply the power of being present. How do you escort a mother who has lost her only child and you escort her into the emergency room where she wants to see her lifeless son lying on a gurney, the power of being present. You do the best that you can to hold her up to keep her from fainting and falling out while your heart is broken. The power of being present. How do you and what type of example do you set when you're in the room and one of our loved ones have been given eight hours to live, been taken off of life support, and you're there with the mom, the father, the spouse, the sister, the brother-in-law, and the pastor waiting for our fallen hero to pass away, the power of being present. Sometimes there are no words that need to be spoken, but being present truly matters. When you respond to a hospital and you greet and meet a family who is there waiting for news because their trooper has been shot twice in the face while experiencing unprecedented and demonstrated great bravery in the face of three monsters, the power of being present. And the last example that I'll share with you, the power of being present. When you're tasked with ex escorting a fiance into a room whom her state trooper was just killed, her fiance, and on that day that he was killed, she had just purchased her wedding dress for their wedding that was scheduled to take place two months later. The power of being present, the support that we give to one another, because I will share with you, as I encourage these family members and our state troopers, please know the power of presence that I am trying to give off, I receive it back in return. Resiliency. Thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you so much, Colonel McNeil. Um, as Colonel McNeil was speaking, I couldn't help but think about 2013 um, when Trooper Michael Potts was shot in Durham. Um, just looking through the audience, I see several faces that worked on it. Uh, I was in homicide at the time, and I, so I see several faces that worked on it with us. And then a, several months later, I saw a picture with Colonel McNeil and Trooper Potts standing together, and um, you know he's recovering and back on the job and everything. Um, so next, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Sheriff Cloninger. Sheriff Cloninger has been a lifelong resident of Gaston County, and he served as the elected sheriff since 2004. And um, he's also had more than 40 years of law enforcement experience through different roles. He's also served as an EMT, and as well, he served as the Gaston County prosecutor and had his own law office um, in Gaston County. Um, so I think you've done a lot of service for Gaston County. 
<laughs> Thank you, Sheriff Ponder. Well, uh, that's right. I'm Darth Vader. I uh, went to the dark side and came back. I am a lawyer, but according to North Carolina General Statute, I'm not allowed to practice law, so I do not have a law office anymore. And we started out this saying with some, I think this saying was trying to, what is it, turning knowledge into practice? I don't have much knowledge. Got a lot of experience, though. And if I cry a little bit, it's going to be part of this speech. How many of you want to be a chief? I know all you troopers want to be sheriff, but <laughs> that's a North Carolina joke if you're not from North Carolina. But how many of you want to be the boss? Because you better think about it. Every day we prepare ourselves as the boss for a line of duty death, shot, something happened in the jail. Suicide, we, we, it's, it's prominent. We, we think about it. We're prepared for that. On May 20th, 2018, I'm in the water of Lake Wiley trying to cut a towel off the drive shaft of my jet ski. So I'm not really happy. I wanted a day to go ride and relax. Then my phone rings. I didn't get out of the water to go answer it. Then my phone rings. I still didn't go answer it. The fourth time it rang, I went and answered it. It was my chief deputy informing me that I needed to get to Bessemer City, North Carolina, uh, that one of my deputies had been murdered by her father. What happened on that day was just unfathomable, unbelievable, because I happened to know the dad all my life. He came to me and asked me to hire Kate. And I gave her a chance because she was bordering on which way in her life was going. That day, the whole family, over 10 family members had gone to church together, went to a restaurant in Bessemer City. Roger had them sit in front of a window at the front of the building. And that, where, where that window was, was a ramp to get up onto the porch. He went outside, excused himself and went outside, got in his vehicle, backed it up, and ran full steam through the restaurant, through his family. He killed his daughter-in-law. He severely injured his son, who was a Gaston County policeman. He drove Kate through the building into a metal post. And her body laid in a building in the back. He severely injured his wife. minor injuries to his grandchildren. And I've always known Roger to love his family more than anything in the world. So I'm jumping my truck and I run emergency traffic to Bessemer City. I get there and it's a little bit of a cluster. Cause the police chief, I just talked to him, he just landed, the Bessemer City police chief had just landed in Charlotte. So I get there, we got firemen in the crime scene, we got people running around. And so I became sheriff. All the while hurting. Put it in the box, right? Got the crime scene settled down, got the people settled down. Chief Tom Ellis, who you know, gets there. The chief of Mount Holly gets there. And I want you to listen to those, those things I'm telling you. My personnel are on the scene. Plus, all of a sudden, more of my people are coming to the, to the line, 
to, to, to the crime scene barrier. Because one thing about Kate, everybody in the office loved her. And she worked in the jail, so I saw her a lot. She was just so popular. So I'm dealing with the folks coming, tell them they need to go into the office, go to the office, don't be here. Some would leave, some would stand up the hill crying. Kate's still there. The uh, daughter-in-law has been taken to the hospital where she died at the hospital. So as the boss, I'm supposed to be tough, right? I'm supposed to show no weakness, which I didn't. I took care of business until the chief of Mount Holly, Don Roper, and the chief Ellis came over to me and said, Alan, you need to go to the command post. I said, no, I'm not. You need to go to the command post. Because I was not handling it that good, particularly after the coroner asked me to come identify her body. as the boss. When you are the boss, we don't train you as the boss how to handle it. We need to. But the most important thing is in those critical instances in a county, every time you have something, what do you get from me? in the county or the state the chiefs the sheriffs need to become molded together when something like this happens this is unusual do you realize that oh I forgot to tell you Kate's fiance who was a Gastonia city police officer was there also I saw him, I didn't recognize him. I saw this man, this young man, and, it, and this man, and an older man and woman wandering around the corner of the crime scene. And so I'm going after him to get him out of the crime scene when I get up there and I said, what are y'all doing? And he said, Sheriff, I'm Alex. And I said, oh Lord, son, why are you way over here in the woods? Come on, we're gonna get you in a patrol car. No one even addressed him. But you have to understand that I had the chiefs my peers come to me to help take care of me. And everybody in law enforcement, or if you're not, or if you affect law enforcement, we have to teach that partnership. You know, firemen, all they do is cook all day. We know that. <laughs> Squirt a little water. But that's the same thing that if a fire chief, if my fire chief in Gastonia has a critical incident, I'm calling him. I'm saying, I'm here, you need me, want me to come. And sometimes you just know to go. Where you walk up and say, chief, I'm here. It, during the, I ain't gonna call it the golden hour, cause it's not. During the 12 hours of a total hell, the things calm down. Cause you know, Roger had to come to my jail. I had to take care of that. Because it just so happens that Kate shift is the on duty shift that night and they wanted to kill Roger. I promise you that. So I had put, I, you know, we, I got a, another captain to sit with Roger the whole time watching him till we could get him central prison. In my office, we brought in every chaplain I had because my chiefs were handling, it wasn't my crime scene anyway, but my chief was handling my, my deputy. Charlotte, CMPD, my chiefs that were assisting me, they called Chief Caputney and said, we need help. Because this became a big media, we had helicopters all over the place. We we're getting ready to move Kate's body and, and somebody said, 
Alan, have you got Alex's number? Alex works for WBT. And I said, yeah. He says, we need to get that helicopter out of here. I gave him the number. Somebody handled it. They got Charlotte to bring their PIOs over and help us. At the office, we brought in every minister I had. But in the generations we have now, okay, I've got a few more minutes. In the generations we have now, now I'm come from the old school. When I went, when, when in, I policed as a small town police officer with the Gaston County Police, I've prosecuted murder cases, I've defended murder cases, and I've been jail administrator and I've ran the sheriff's office for almost 16 years. But back in the old days when you're on the street, before you had take home cars, when you had something bad happen, and there's a book about it, you had choir practice at the end of the shift, at the end of the rotation. I see some smiles back there. And that was our therapy. There may be some alcohol involved, but that was our therapy. But things have changed in law enforcement, take home cars, that doesn't occur. so. You're not using peer counseling. You just, we just, why'd you say chief, just put it inside? The younger generation doesn't want to do that. Can't do that. And shouldn't have to do that. We discussed this very issue with the crime commission yesterday. And, and you know, it, it is a forthcoming thing, but getting back to Kate, I forgot to bring a handkerchief up here. I'm sorry. We brought in all our preachers. But again, this younger generation may not have a preacher, may not even have a re religious relationship. That was one thing that I did not realize in my office. Because I'm old school. I think everybody has a church. But there's a lot that don't. So they were being canceled by Religion. Oh, you're so sweet. Y'all just got tired of me snotting on my nose. But I didn't even consider that the, the persons that haven't been brought up in the church. We've got more and more of those folks. Or they've been brought up, their religion is watching something on TV or in an auditorium. Chief uh, Ellis came to me the next morning and said, Alan, when are you going to do your debrief? I ain't going to do no debrief. I got too much going on. I've got Roger here. He said, Alan, when are you going to do your debrief? That came from the Highway Patrol. Chief Ellis is a former first sergeant of the Highway Patrol. Thank God he only wanted to be a police chief. But and I knew about debriefs, but I was suffering inside that I wasn't thinking good. My chief came to me and took care of me. We brought SLED has a debrief team. We brought North Carolina Highway Patrol debrief in because you have to realize Kate was from Dallas uh, and I was on Dallas. I still am on Dallas Rescue. I had Six Dallas Rescue Ambulance there. The Volunteer Fire Department in Bessemer City, they knew Kate. Every police officer knew one of the victims that was on scene. Because we involved four law enforcement agencies in this. It was some way affected. Our debrief consisted of over 108 people. And we brought in everybody we could and did the debrief. Did it help? Yes. And so I've, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm back in, I'm back in control now. My chiefs got me there because we have that partnership because they know I'll come to them. But I kept seeing two people that didn't seem right in the office. And I go up to them and say, you doing all right? You doing all right, Sergeant? 
the sergeant was the first to Kate tried to perform CPR on her. And she said, yeah, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Another sergeant wasn't on the scene at first, came up there, but had a, a great relationship with Kate. You all right? I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I about lost those two people because they weren't fine. As the boss, when someone you feel in your gut ain't fine after a critical incident, and they won't go to EAP, they won't do this, then you have to look at them, and I, and I did this. I called uh, my female sergeant in, and I said, I'm going to need your gun and badge. She said, why? I said, because you haven't gone to EAP. I'm all right. I'm fine. To give me your gun and badge. I'll go. All right. Then you can keep your gun and badge. Now, the guys that wear and ladies in here that wear a gun and a badge know what that means. You may have to do that as the boss is actually take someone's job to get them to go to treatment. Because if you don't go get them to go to treatment, you're going to lose them anyway. Either they're going to kill themselves or they're going to mess up so bad they're going to become alcoholic, possibly drug. So you as the boss, and you want to be boss, have to do this. And you talk about remembering. In my office, we have several remembrances of Kate. I think it's wonderful. I got a section of my office thinks it's wonderful. Then I got another section of my office thinks it's terrible. Because this section wants to forget. And that's the section I worry about and try everything I can to get them to go to EAP and things because Wanting to forget is one thing, but we, we, we as humans learn from our life's experiences and learning how to deal with it is so important. So what I want to leave you with is if you're going to be the boss, get some training and be prepared. Because when this happens, because this unfortunately going to happen, you got to take care of business on the front end. You got to take care of your people. But if you don't take care of yourself and if you don't have the relationships with the men and women who sit in the position that you're in, then you become an island. You come alone. You become by yourself. And I promise you, you can't deal with these situations by yourself. All right, you're supposed to end something with a joke, right? It's hard to end something with a joke when, when this deals with such suffering. And uh, I'm not even sure I talked about the right thing, y'all. I did. I, resiliency. I forgot to say that word. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Thank you, sir. Sheriff Cloninger. Um, we, we're going to have some time for some questions, but Dr. Rainier is on the line. She should be popping up on the screen. Um, so she's going to give a brief presentation, and then we can have some questions for the entire panel. Um, so I'm going to introduce her since she's remote. Uh, Dr. Jen Rainier is a research psychologist in RTI's policing research program. She received her bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Pennsylvania and her master's and doctoral degrees in organizational psychology with a specialty in occupational health from Portland State University. Dr. Rainier uses her expertise in workplace health and safety to conduct workplace and workforce surveys, qualitative studies, and employee trainings and evaluations in criminal justice context. 
Her research focuses on worker health, job-related stress, diversity and inclusion, and organizational effectiveness. Uh, she works in RTI's Waltham office outside of Boston, which is um, where she's at now. Um, so in a few moments, we should cut over to Dr. Rainier. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Are you all able to see me and hear me? Well, you're real little to me. <laughs> yes, we can. Did you say real little? <laughs> yeah. I will gesture largely. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I was supposed to be in the room with you all, but the universe had other plans. But I'm happy that I can at least be here virtually today. So I'm so thankful um, to both of the speakers who just talked for sharing those incredibly powerful stories. I really wish that those weren't the realities of the job for unfortunately too many of you out there. Um, but hearing these stories helps us as researchers to better understand these realities and better identify how we can help. So I'm thankful for having the opportunity to hear about those situations and, and how you work together to get through them. So I wanna close this panel by uh, addressing two questions related to the research on resilience in the workplace. One, what does the existing research tell us about how to increase resilience? And two, how can our research better serve law enforcement? So we've talked a little bit about what resilience is. I wanna to touch on this a little bit more. Um, the definition that I have here is from the research literature and it's focused on resilience at work. And it says that resilience is the developable capacity to rebound or bounce back from adversity, conflict, and failure, or even positive events, progress, and increased responsibility. So I think this is an important definition because obviously resilience is super important and probably the most important in the face of disaster and traumatic events like the ones we just heard about. But that's not the only time that it matters. It matters in the face of any major change. And we hear a lot today about how much policing is changing how police officers are expected to deal with different types of issues like mental health and homelessness. And I, I know it's not just police officers, but other first responders as well. So when new programs and policies are enacted and officers have new and different responsibilities, this can be stressful and, and require resilience too, even if the changes are positive ones. So as has been mentioned already, you know, it's, it's really important to lay the groundwork for resilience before something happens, not after. So I'd like to talk just briefly about how that can be done. So because I'm a researcher and a psychologist, I'm going to talk about a theory. Hopefully it doesn't put you to sleep. Uh, but it's one of my favorite theories called the conservation of resources theory. It's a theory about stress, and it's also a motivational uh, theory that explains why we act the way that we do. Um, and it also provides some insight in how we can increase resilience through resources. So the main tenet of this theory, which is kind of a common sense theory, as many psychological theories are, but it's helpful, I think, for understanding behavior, is that really all of us strive to obtain, retain, foster, and protect valuable resources. So when we say resources, we really mean everything that we care about, including what the theory calls objects, conditions, personal characteristics, and energies. So objects refer to the physical things we need, like a house, car, tools for work. Conditions refer to things like employment, seniority, marriage or relationship status, and safety. Personal characteristics refer to the value of skills and traits that we want to acquire and maintain. And energies refer to things that you can save up and use, like money, knowledge, credit, and sometimes the most valuable one of time. So collectively, these resources encompass all the things that we want and need for a happy and stable life. And the theory posits that stress occurs in three different scenarios. When key resources are threatened with loss, when key resources are lost, or when there's failure to gain key resources after a significant effort. So I think that this is an important consideration, especially for law enforcement, that it's not just when we lose something, but when there's a threat of loss that we can experience stress and require resilience. So digging in just a little deeper, there are four key principles related to this theory that I wanna talk about uh, very quickly. So, First is the primacy of loss principle, right? Uh, this means that loss is more salient than gain. We all know this anecdotally, when something bad happens, it hits us a lot harder than when something good happens. The resource investment principle, so this says that people must invest resources 
in order to protect against resource loss, to recover from losses, and to gain resources. So I think this is where agencies can really start making a difference. This is how you build resilience. So think about what resources your people need uh, to have in place so that they can survive and manage and feel supported when unpredictable loss does occur. Finally, there's a, or not finally, thirdly, there's a gain paradox principle, which says basically that resource gain is even more important in the face of high losses, which I think, you know, we've heard from the previous talks. So this means that it's important to consider what kinds of supports you can have in place to build people up in the most challenging of times. And finally, the desperation principle. So this says that when people's resources are exhausted, Basically, they enter into this defensive self-preservation mode and may act defensive, aggressive, or even irrational. So I just want folks to keep in mind that when someone seems to be acting like a jerk, you know, this can manifest in different ways. It may be because they're totally depleted and they're needing help the most, even though they may not appear that way. So I think it's just important to recognize. And this brings me to one final concept related to this theory, which isn't on the slide, but called loss spirals and it basically just means that the research shows what I think we all know anyway that you know losses tend to come in trends right one thing goes wrong and then another thing goes wrong and another thing and it's hard to, it can be hard to break that cycle once loss starts to occur so as employing organizations it's important for us to see this when it's happening when our with our employees and break that cycle before people end up in a really bad place so using data from a number of studies, researchers have developed a model of psychological resilience in the workplace. And they found that the individual factors that most affect resilience are neuroticism, mindfulness, self-efficacy, and coping. So neuroticism, as you probably know, is a personality trait. Uh, neuroticism is negatively, negatively related to resilience, where the other three here um, are positively related. But people who are neurotic tend to experience more negative feelings like anxiety, worry, fear, and anger. So this is the one characteristic that agencies can probably do a little bit less about. It's hard to change folks' personalities. Although I know that some agencies do, do use personality tests um, to select for folks with different characteristics. So that's one thing that can be done that's sort of actionable in this area. Mindfulness, however, is something that agencies can affect. So, Effectiveness mindfulness trainings have been conducted among police officers, and there's some great free mindfulness resources out there for agencies and for officers. So one that I learned about recently uh, is called United We OM, OM as in OM, uh, which provides free yoga and meditation both in person and online, not only for law enforcement, uh, but their immediate family members as well. And then a lot of the resilience trainings out there target both self-efficacy and coping. So as many of you know, you know, when something bad happens, the worst part about it can be our own thoughts about what happened, right? So you question yourself, what you could have done differently. You replay things over and over in your mind and you get caught in these thinking cycles that really aren't productive and that prevent you from moving forward. So resilience trainings can help people to practice more productive ways of thinking so that when something stressful or traumatic happens, they have the skills to reroute negative and unproductive thoughts. So that's not to say that we try to get rid of all negative thoughts. It's normal and healthy to be sad and to have negative reactions when something bad happens, but it's that kind of endless cycle of negative thinking that you can't get out of that we want to be able to avoid. As has been mentioned by our previous speakers, agencies uh, can also help to support uh, staff in their ability to cope by putting support networks in place like peer support or mentoring pro programs or mental health services so that, as we know is so critical, people don't have to deal with challenging times alone. So these individual characteristics that agencies can help foster are important because they affect psychological outcomes that are key to both individual well-being and uh, performance and agency well-being, like burnout and depression and anxiety, both directly and through their effects on resilience. And tying it back to the theory, these are the kinds of resources that agencies can help people to build. So I just want to spend a quick minute uh, on the second question I said I would address, which is how can research better serve law enforcement? So there are already some great collaborations going on out there between researchers and practitioners. And I think one thing we need to do is better disseminate the tools that are already out there. And we need to create additional tools that use scientific rigor, but are useful in a practical sense to those of you out there doing the work in the field. 
One example of a place where you can find some great resources for resilience and mental health is the IACP webpage on mental wellness of officers. So there you can find additional information on some of the resilience trainings that are being conducted and evaluated and practical, practical tools like a vicarious trauma toolkit and an employee family and wellness guide, which contains a variety of different resources for sustaining mental well-being. The National Alliance for Mental Illness, NAMI, also has some great resources on their website uh, on resources specifically for law enforcement and their families. So I'm hopeful that in the coming years, the research will continue to improve and we will build even stronger connections between researchers and law enforcement uh, through events such as the one that you all are attending today uh, to create additional new resources, programs, and practices that will really make a difference. So one quick final note uh, from me, I know we're almost out of time, uh, is just to be inclusive in your approach to resilience and supporting the well-being of those that you work with. So remember that all employees need the resources to build resilience. Consider everyone who might be affected by various events or changes. Sometimes it's a broader group of individuals than you might initially think. And as we heard from our previous two speakers, remember that those who are in positions of leadership and those who are providing support and care to others also need care themselves and possibly even more care because they're taking on that burden of taking care of other people. And finally, just keep in mind that everyone is different. What one person needs to cope might be very different from what someone else needs. So, you know, as has already been expressed, it's important to know your employees um, and ask them what kinds of supports they need uh, in order to best serve them. So with that, I thank you for your time and Hopefully we have just a couple of minutes for Q&A and I think my friends in the room are going to help lead that discussion. Thank you. That's so I left out one thing. On your choices to the fire department, to EMS, to anyone on the critical debrief, don't use local people. Tone. Bring them away. Bring them from Asheville. Bring them from South Carolina. Bring them from the Far East. Why you don't use local people? If I'm sitting there talking to a, a, a Dallas police officer that's part of the critical debrief, am I going to show him weakness because I'm going to see him again and again and again? No, I'll talk to this stranger maybe because I'll never see him again. But I have his phone number to call him if I need him. So think about that when you're creating your uh, critical debriefing teams. Thank you. Look, we have time for a question or two. I got no question. There was a comment online uh, from a former law enforcement executive in another state and they said that in order to address some of the issues discussed, they mandated that officers must get counseling when involved in certain critical incidents, such as officer-involved shootings, et cetera, by making this mandatory, it has taken away the stigma associated with getting counseling. I'd love to comment on that. It's mandatory. I'd love to comment on that. For our organization, it's mandatory. I'm sorry. You're going to go. You're going to see the doctor. You're going to see the medical staff. and then. Uh, with our organization, we, we have uh, majors and above that are on state call. And when a critical incident happens with one of our personnel, that major, or even if it's me for my week of duty, if our troop, one of our troopers involved in a critical incident, they're mine for the rest of their career, or for that matter, for my career, to always reach out to them, to support them, to make a personal connection with them, to make sure that they feel whole. But to answer your question within our organization, it's mandatory. We relieve them of duty. They have to go see our medical staff and, and it's not a negative stigma that's attached to it. You know, we would just want to make our people, we want them to feel and be made whole. In our office, it is a requirement if you are involved in an officer involved shooting or something like that, yes, you have to go get it. But in that instance that we had, a lot of folks were involved in the critical incident. It was a personal effect. And so then it became 
to us and, and we're looking at how to handle this better. And that's what you always do. Look how to handle something better is I really couldn't require some of them to go until I saw a need for them to go. And so that was our issue. We may have failed at it, but that was our issue. And, and one of the things I'd like to also add to that confidentiality is a huge, huge mandate. What takes place in these briefings, they have to be confidential because if not, and they have to be trustworthy. You know, they have to be trusting relationships that are built from these debriefings. You have these macho folks that are, think they can, they're supermen or superwomen. It's very hard for them to humble themselves and to say, I need help. But how I see it, I see it as the opposite. Someone that can realize that they need support and they need help, to me, that demonstrates great character and great strength. So, but in order for them to go through and to completely heal, they have to know that they are supported, but most importantly, the things that they share and what they're feeling and going through, it has to remain confidential. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I have a quick question. Um, so I'm interested about this idea of mandatory counseling or turning your badge and gun counseling. Um, and I'm curious if, I don't know if there's any clinical psychologists in the room, or maybe I might direct it to you, Jen, if you have um, any ideas on it, but I know there's different modes of therapy, right? So you can, there's cognitive behavioral therapy and other types of therapy, and some people might respond better to some versus others. And I'm wondering if there's alternatives to therapy that might, you know, I'm wondering if, if mandatory counseling might have harmful effects for some people if they respond better to a different type of, I guess, um, therapy or, um, you know, resolving the, the issues they're dealing with. So I'm just curious what types of counseling is, are involved and if, if there's any, if you use research on different uh, modes of therapy um, and if the, anyone has heard of any research where there might be alternatives to therapy that might work better for some people. I'm, I'm not a researcher, but I'll tell you this. The sergeant, she's back 100%. When we threatened to take her job because she, she was a, getting to be a danger to the public because she wasn't paying attention, she said she didn't enjoy EAP. She wasn't getting nothing from it. And we said, all right. So we found a uh, psychologist <laughs> in Rock Hill, South Carolina, who basically specializes in law enforcement, fire and EMS trauma. She, when we made her go to him and he, they related good and he helped fix her. Same with the other gentleman. They didn't like EAP. So we sent down there to this more of this, someone that could relate better and it's helped fix them. When I say fix, they doing better. Nobody can get fixed. I think Dr. Renier can best answer the second portion of your question. But when you when you are trying to make people whole, number one, you got to meet them where they are, and there is no one size fits all. Everybody participates in a situation completely different. You know, all we can do is offer these excellent resources to our personnel. You know, for us. I'm pleased to say we have something that's called a all hazards critical incidents response. All of our supervisors have been trained on it. You know, we're required to keep that guide in the car, but when our folks go through these set of circumstances, they don't go through them alone. We invite their spouses to come along and to be a part of it with them because the family at home, they're the ones that are most impacted with this. The state trooper may be the one that goes to work every day, but these families are just as much greatly impacted about this from a holistic standpoint. You know, we have a, a medical doctor. We have this member's assistance team that is made up of also medical professions and doctors and psychologists and also highly trained peer-to-peer -peer counselors. But what's the most important piece out of that? 
is we select counselors, the peer-to-peer -peer part, people that have gone through very similar set of circumstances. And it's all confidential and it's lifelong. It's just not, we're going to give you this, all this great uh, counseling and support for a month and we're finished with you. I mean, it's debriefings forever. You know, once a year, these partnerships, we got to support these folks forever, not just the first month. But great question, and thank you. Dr. Rainier, could you add anything to his, his question? Yeah, I mean, I think you all are on point that, you know, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. And I think that having it be mandatory that folks receive some sort of supportive services does help reduce that stigma because then it's just a normal thing that everyone is doing. But I think the wider variety of options there are, the better. I think it also speaks to, you know, the benefit of having established supportive relationships before something happens. So I know, you know, sometimes there are mentoring programs or peer programs where folks have more regular content and talk about sort of the more everyday stressors of the job in addition to just responding to traumatic events. So I think that can be really helpful because then it's not, you know, when you're already stressed and something traumatic has happened that you're trying to establish a new relationship with someone, that relationship is already there and that trust is already established, like you said, whether it's with a, you know, a counselor or, an, or a medical provider or with a peer or a mentor. I think having those things in place beforehand does really help. And I'd like to add one thing. Having, I'm going to say something nice about the Highway Patrol. <laughs> having the highway patrol out there <laughs> for a police department that has three members or a sheriff's office that has 10 members that to have the support they bring in in critical incidents is important and uh and that partnership's important that's the reason i talk about i emphasize the partnership it don't have to be just in the county if I know a sheriff's hurting, he's needing help, he's in a critical incident, I can call Glenn and say, Glenn, get your captain up to Swanson County. We don't have a Swanson County. I just said that. But <laughs> get, you, get your captain up to Swanson. That, that sheriff's had a shooting. He needs help. His people need help. That police officer in, in uh, Conway, there actually is a Conway, North Carolina. But – and it has a four-man police department. That state resource is wonderful. And that's the only thing good I'll say about Highway Patrol. <laughs> so my question is, how do you manage the uh, significant outpouring of respect and support you would get from the community with your need to kind of move forward? Oftentimes, you know, people want to bring by things for us to kind of show their support. Um, how do you kind of cut that off and kind of move forward, or do you kind of just let that play out? For me, we let it play out. I mean, we had people bring meals. We had people bring blue, blue line flags. We had a lot of cards and so forth. You're dealing with the community, and, and that's one thing we're not looking at is the community may be hurting also mm -hmm. just for that loss. And so to – deny them to express their sympathy for your office or for your police department or for the troopers it would be wrong and be disrespectful to them. And, and I would say under no circumstances would I ever want it to be cut off. I want it to continue forever. And because all of the accoutrements, everything that I would receive in my office, I would always make sure that they were sent to and packaged up and sent to the family members. Because again, this is a lifelong loss that they're going to experience, and we just don't want it to ever end. And I'll add to it also, the folks that work for you, if they come to you and say, we want to do something special to remember, Kate, listen to them, because yes. that's what we do. Uh, we have a Officer of the Year Award, the Kate Self Officer of the Year Award now, where we used to not have an Officer of the Year. But the people, the men and women, the sheriff's office brought that forth and wanted to do it. And, and that's important. That's a part of healing. And one final question. Uh, is there any research on benefits of police agencies having some sort of psychologist on staff or in the building? Can't afford it. <laughs> and I'll just mention uh, the research part of it. 
I can't speak to that. That's a question for Dr. Rayner. But with the Highway Patrol, we have a, I'm very fortunate that we are here in North Carolina, you know, four or five miles down from Chapel Hill, from Duke, from Wake Med. We have some phenomenal uh, facilities that are available to us. But with the patrol, we have a medical director that's on station at our, our campus. And we also have a psychologist that's on contract with us. And we greatly appreciate the benefit that they bring to our organization. And that's the reason it's important to have this partnership because some of us, smaller agencies, we can't afford that. What do you, what do you think is the greatest fear that our subordinates um, refuse or scared to come forward to admit they need help? In my situation, um, I had a newly promoted female sergeant. She was concerned that she had appeared to be weak, that she couldn't handle it. And this wasn't true, but that was her perception that she didn't want nobody else that she was supervising to think that she couldn't handle the job. And, and that's what she told me. And, and my response to that is using a real life situation to share with the rest of our folks. I had a state trooper that had been involved in a shooting incident. And unfortunately, this was his second critical incident that he had been involved in. And initially, he says, hey, Colonel, I'm fine. I'm good. I call to check on him two weeks later. Hey, sir, I'm fine. I'm good. Three weeks later, he said, hey, sir, I'm having some issues and I think I need some help, but I don't want to seem weak. And I have celebrated him because identifying for yourself, self-policing yourself, stating that something isn't right and you want to be made whole. You know, I celebrate him to this day because he chose to ask for help. We were going to give it to him regardless, but he asked for more than what we initially offered him based upon what he said. So I think we, as police leaders, we need to celebrate those who need help. There's nothing wrong with saying, I need help. And I think that's the true message that as leaders we have to put out to our people it's okay to ask for help. There's nothing gonna to happen to you. You're not gonna be looked down upon for asking for help. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. But if they need help, you've got to do it. Thank you so much, Sheriff. Thank you so much, Colonel. Uh, we wanted to let, um, real quick, we wanted to let Dr. Rainier wrap it up with one final point, and then we can bring up the next panel. And oh, do I have a final point? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I was just going to respond to the question and say that the research absolutely does show uh, that having support services in place um, leads to better outcomes in terms of better resilience, better coping in the face of traumatic events, and uh, less likely to go out on disability due to mental health issues, et cetera. So that absolutely does help. I think what that looks like in a given agency can be very different because of resources and other constraints, whether it's someone internal or external, I think that's less important. It's just that there are options and uh, the, the better, the more options that are available, um, the more likely they are to, to suit different officers' needs. So the research definitely does support that. So I just wanted to add that point. Thank you so much. Now we can conclude the panel. Thank you.